Tell us about this new discovery. Well, uh, on uh, November 2nd, um, Gennady Borisov, uh, uh, an amateur astronomer, discovered uh, an object uh, near the sun that uh, is actually barely bound to the sun. So it's almost interstellar, uh, but uh, most likely it came from the outskirts of the solar system, the Oort cloud. Um, and uh, that was surprising because uh, that's around the time, the same week, that uh, another interstellar object uh, passed close to the sun, uh, three I atlas. That one we are confident uh, is interstellar because it was moving at 60 kilometers per second, very high speed, 600 times larger than the fastest car we have on Earth. Wow. Uh, the reason I know that is because I went uh, to a NASCAR car race where the uh, the racer put uh, three I atlas on the hood of his car, and I told him that's not a big compliment for uh, your for, for three I atlas <laughs> because it's already moving 600 times faster than your car can ever reach. Uh, but at any event, so three I atlas was definitely not bound to the sun. This new object uh, appears to be barely bound to the sun, and may may have come from. Uh, the outskirts of the solar system and was in a plunging orbit that got all the way close to the sun and we just noticed it. Uh, now the interesting question is could it have uh, originated from 3i Atlas? Is it at all related to it? Mm. Because uh, if 3i Atlas for example is a natural comet it could have lost a fragment, a piece of it that was torn apart if it is a mothership, a spacecraft, it could have uh, uh, on purpose released a probe uh, into the inner solar system. So that's an interesting question and it turns out that this object um, has uh, a, an orbit in a plane that is almost perpendicular to the plane of the orbit of 3i Atlas. So if we just use uh, gravity uh, to calculate its trajectory, it was definitely not related to 3i Atlas. Uh, the closest they got to each other is of order 100 million kilometers, so not very close. Uh, and so the two are unrelated. It's just a coincidence that two uh, unusual objects showed up around the same time close to the sun. Uh, however, if it's a technological object, of course it could have maneuvered and um, transited between the two trajectories that appear to be distinct from each other. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, uh, we I mentioned the fact that we have asked for our viewers to kind of chime in here and uh, ask some or pose some questions for you. Um, Tenth Crane is asking, if Atlas originated from the nearest star, how long has it been traveling? Right, so um, for it to um, arrive uh, close to the sun from uh, the outskirts, the outer boundary of the solar system, uh, that's the edge of the Oort cloud, so-called Oort cloud. It's 100,000 times the Earth-Sun separation. It took it 8,000 years to travel from there uh, to its location right now. 8,000 years is when humans started uh, recording their uh, history. So 8,000 years ago is the, the oldest records we have of human history. Mm. Um, and uh, so that's uh, in cosmological terms it's not a long a long time now we don't know where it originated the, what is its apparent star um, it could have come from uh, very far away and then uh, it took it um, uh, many billions of years to arrive here uh, if it's a natural object 3i atlas uh, then based on its speed it has a high speed uh, it could have originated from an old star because old stars uh, they get kicked around for much longer and they acquire larger speeds than uh, 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 young stars. So uh, a calculation that I did with my student uh, indicates that in that case it's probably 10 billion years old, maybe 7 billion years old, older than the sun. Okay, so the star that hosted it uh, would have been older, uh, but uh, we don't really know. Uh, where it came from and we don't know how how high was the ejection speed of that uh, object 3i atlas from the parent star so we don't know for sure uh, the duration of its journey if it's technological of course all bets are off because the question is where are the senders you know they can be very near in which case 
um, the journey was very short. Uh, or they can be far and then obviously they sent it out before even knowing that we exist. Oh, my brain is spinning like the sun or one of the planets. I don't know. Uh, but, okay, uh, Rob here. And we're, we're trying to get to as many questions as possible. Uh, Rob says, why don't we see more interstellar visitors considering the size of our solar system? Oh, there are, uh, if we are talking about the visitors that arrive at random, you know, rocks, for example, or icy rocks, then uh, for everyone that we see in the inner solar system within the separation of the Earth from the Sun, there should be a quadrillion right now, 10 to the power 15 such objects within the, the solar system as a whole, going out to 100,000 times the Earth-Sun separation. The reason is simple. The volume of the solar system at 100,000 times the Earth-Sun separation, 100,000 is is, is, is basically a hundred thousand cubed uh, times the volume associated with the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. So for everyone you see near us, uh, you know, between the Earth and the Sun, there should be a quadrillion right now in the solar system. So definitely a very big number. And what it means is also that every, if we find one, uh, the, the, every star should have uh, produced a quadrillion of those uh, if they come at random, because the volume of every associated with every star is roughly the volume that the solar system has around the sun. There's just so much that we don't know. Uh, just so you know, um, someone commented from a friend, you should be the boss of NASA. <laughs> um, but uh, from Andre, he says, would you be happy or concerned if Atlas is a spacecraft? Oh, I would be very happy because I think humanity desperately needs a dose of cosmic modesty. Uh, we lack humility. You know, we say perhaps we are at the top of the food chain uh, in the universe, not just on Earth. You know, we go to restaurants and eat other animals because we think that they are less intelligent than we are. Mm. We would never eat an animal that is more intelligent than we are. But, uh, of course, we can be arrogant uh, 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 here on Earth uh, so far. Maybe AI systems will make us a little bit more modest. But my hope is that we would realize that we have siblings out there among the stars. And those siblings, some of them, are far more accomplished than we are. So it will teach us modesty. But on top of that, we could learn from them. It's just like learning from a smarter student in a classroom. Well, I definitely feel like I'm in school right now <laughs> from Hug. Um, what would happen if something like Atlas were to crash into Earth? Oh, that would be devastating. It would be similar to uh, what happened to the non-avian dinosaurs when they witnessed uh, a rock, an asteroid the size of Manhattan Island mm. uh, colliding with Earth. They basically perished. They died. Mm. And the same kind of catastrophe would occur if uh, three Atlas were to crash uh, on Earth, and uh, gladly, it doesn't look like it's uh, approaching uh, very close to Earth. It will come within uh, 100, uh, about uh, 250 uh, million kilometers from Earth uh, on December 19th. Uh, that would allow us to observe it with our best telescopes and get much more information about it. As of the last few days, we got images that show that there are more than seven jets coming out of it. And, uh, you know, one possibility is that these jets are powered by um, uh, ice, uh, pockets of ice that uh, is being uh, illuminated by sunlight and warmed up and, and uh, the ice sublimates and you end up with these jets. They go out to millions of kilometers away from the object. But another possibility is these, these are technological thrusters on a spacecraft. And we can easily tell the difference because technological thrusters produce uh, uh, velocities that are far in excess of what you can get from uh, some pocket of ice being illuminated, warmed up by sunlight. So we can tell, we can measure the speed of those jets in the coming weeks and then uh, immediately know the nature of this object. So that, that's why science is so much fun, because it's like a detective story. We can figure out the truth by collecting clues. So you're like the Sherlock Holmes of astronomy. All right. Uh, Miguel is asking, why are you the only scientist speaking in serious terms about what this could be? 
Well, um, scientists are used to dealing with uh, 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 objects uh, at great distances. Uh, for example, imagine a galaxy at the edge of the universe. It's billions of light years away. And uh, therefore, they are used to having no consequence to what they are saying about that galaxy because uh, it will not affect our life in any way and that's therefore they can just adapt the most likely interpretation and stick with it uh, however when we have a visitor to our backyard there is a risk from it if it's technological that it might be a threat to humanity and uh, we all know i mean governments know uh, intelligence agencies know that we must take seriously low probability events uh, that could have huge implications on society. And so um, uh, I regard the, this visit of an interstellar object as one example. Even if we assign a low likelihood for it to be technological or a threat to humanity, we must take it seriously, collect as much data as possible so we can figure out its nature and make sure that it's just a rock. Uh, and that's something that scientists don't fully understand because for them it's just a question of what is the most likely explanation. The other thing I should say about experts is that, for example, uh, comet experts, they are used to comets. And uh, it's just like an AI system, artificial intelligence system that is being trained on a data set that includes only comets. So uh, whatever the AI system says would be that related to comets. It would just say any space object is comets. That's exactly what the experts are doing. They are trained on a data set of comets. They will say anything in the sky is comets. That's, you know, that's their expertise. But I say to them, I say, please expand your training data set because we sent out spacecraft. Okay, so in addition to rocks, we know that in space you can find technological objects. We did it. So then why wouldn't you include in your training data set the possibility that an object coming from outside the solar system might be technological mm. and they just don't get it and they attack me and, and, and criticize me for not believing that this object must be a comet. Hmm. Okay, well, uh, Skywatch wants to know if you think NASA's lab closures could be slowing down investigations. Well, there was uh, data collected on 3i Atlas when it came within 29 million kilometers from Mars. It was taken by the high-rise camera on board the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and it's the sharpest image that we should have at this time, uh, with a 30 kilometer resolution per pixel. And uh, unfortunately, it, it happened on October 3rd, uh, which was two days after the uh, government shutdown started. And the claim from NASA is that due to bureaucratic rules, they are unable to release that data uh, to the rest of the scientific community or to the public. Uh, and uh, as of now, we haven't seen it for 42 days. Uh, so the data exists on some computer, but they were never shared with other scientists. And uh, I believe that this is just a result of bureaucracy overruling science. And I don't like that because I think bureaucracy should serve science, not mm. uh, sabotage or take hostage science. Uh, and so I think someone high up uh, in the administration of NASA should have said, this doesn't make sense. Let's share the data. We have it. It doesn't require much work. Let's just share it at the very least with scientists, because that would help them design future observations. And it didn't happen. So I'm just waiting for the government shutdown to end very soon so we can look at those images. Yeah, well, I think we're all waiting on the government shutdown to end for many different reasons. But um, tell us about the Galileo project that you lead. Right. So um, I started to lead it uh, a few years ago. Um, and the idea is uh, that the, the U.S. government, the intelligence agencies are reporting to the U.S. Congress that there are objects in the sky that they cannot identify. And, uh, you know, the simplest interpretation is these are objects manufactured by adversarial nations. And uh, therefore, it's a national security threat. That's a real issue because we put the trillion dollars a year in the defense budget of 2026. And yet... Uh, the Pentagon is unable to tell us what some objects in the sky are. 
And so they are not doing their job. That's a serious matter. Now, of course, it's possible that this is, these are not human-made objects. Maybe they came from an extraterrestrial origin, in which case it would be even more fascinating to me because I'm an astro- I care what, what lies outside the solar system. Uh, I don't care much about what humans can, can do here on Earth. I, I want to know what's, what's outside. And, of course, if it ends up that one or more of these objects are extraterrestrial in origin, that would be the most important discovery that humanity ever made, scientifically speaking. So, uh, so I decided to lead an, uh, a project uh, that is constructing uh, observatories. Right now we have three of them, and we are monitoring millions of objects uh, on the sky every year. Starting recently, uh, we, we just started to collect data in this way. And we are analyzing it with machine learning software, trying to see if any of the objects behave in ways um, that uh, do not match the flight characteristics of human-made technologies. And uh, that's what the Galileo project is about. We, we also had an expedition to the Pacific Ocean to collect materials from an interstellar meteor just to check if it's not a Voyager-like meteor, an object that collided with Earth that was technological. We know it was interstellar. Uh, the U.S. Space Command confirmed that. And so um, we're still analyzing the materials that we retrieved there. Uh, and in addition, of course, I'm doing my research on uh, interstellar objects like uh, Oumuamua, the first one discovered in 2017 that looked quite anomalous, and 3 I Atlas, which is very intriguing. We are still... Uh, in the process of getting more data on it. All right, uh, only time for a couple more questions. Um, thank you so much for being willing to take so many questions from our viewers. They heard Avi Loeb and the questions just started rolling in here. But uh, so as I hear it, Atlas comes closest to the earth right around Christmas time, maybe like a week before Christmas. So even though we have folks who, who book interviews around here, we wanna go ahead and get you on the books and to say that you'll come back. Yeah, I will definitely do it. Okay, all right. We will talk to you then. And I also, you mentioned, you know, the government shutdown and, and the situation with NASA. I have to loop back into our last conversation where you were a little bit miffed that NASA had reached back out or the government had reached back out to Kim Kardashian before you. And you threw out a lob to Kim Kardashian. Did she reach out to you? Not yet. Um, <laughs> I look forward. That I will be delighted to give her all the information I know, and you know, just uh, illustrate how uh, science is done. Uh, it's by it's like a detective story. It's a lot of fun, and I'm sure Kim will enjoy it. So, if she listens, um, I would uh, be delighted to speak with her. Uh, you know, I don't see myself as uh, a member of a group of people that is privileged uh, in academia in any way. I, th I see myself just a member of the public and, you know, um, and therefore uh, everyone is curious about this object and we can do it together, figure out what, what it is based on the clues that we collect. You know, we don't need the uh, bureaucrats uh, to tell us what it is. Uh, we can just figure it out the way kids do. You know, it's really a privilege to maintain my childhood curiosity mm -hmm. and get paid for it. That's that's the, the, the biggest gift that I can imagine. And uh, that's what science brings. Well, you are uh, for sure certain about the fact that uh, there are a lot of people who are curious. Um, and just again, when oh, we post that you're going to be on the show. <laughs> There's a ton of people who, who respond, so there are a lot of people who are just as curious well, uh, as you. you. know, the biggest reward over the past few weeks for me was uh, emails I get from parents who tell me my daughter now wants to become a scientist. No. And uh, um, that to me is the greatest accomplishment that I can have because uh, surely there are many puzzles that we haven't cracked yet and the next generation will help us uh, get better. I, I believe that the future will be better than the past. Avi Loeb, we certainly hope that. Uh, thank you for coming on yet again, and we'll see you right before Christmas. Looking forward to it. Okay, we'll talk to you then. <laughs>